Okay, I figure I would record this, put this ahead of the actual travel vlog that I did, just so that way I could put the facts about the prison up front before I just start riffing as I'm walking through the camp. So, over the last week, I went to Andersonville Prison. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere in Georgia. Uh, this place held over 30,000 U.S. prisoners at its peak. Men died by the hundreds per day of starvation and disease. When the prisoners were finally liberated from their captivity, they were described as, quote, human skeletons amid hellish scenes of desolation, unquote. So when you hear that, you might think of a concentration camp in Europe underneath Nazi Germany. No. Um, so this place and what happened there occurred in the U.S. state of Georgia in what was originally known or called Camp Sumpner. But after the U.S. Civil War ended in 1865, it was known as Andersonville Prison. The camp was open from February of 1864 until its liberation by Union troops in May of 1865 when the American Civil War ended. Here's what the camp looked like at what you could call its heyday, and here is what the camp looks like now. The camp was bordered by a multi-faceted wood fence wall, and they have like a gate replica that you can walk through yourself, and I'll talk about that later. You can also see these triangle-shaped fortifications where cannon were in place to defend the camp in the case of attack. Running through the middle of the camp was a creek where prisoners could fetch water for themselves. Unfortunately, it was also where they had the camp latrine, so naturally dysentery and typhoid, typhoid fever ran rampant throughout the camp. In the southwest corner of the camp, you have the built-up fortifications where the guards and camp commander or commandant resided. In the northeast corner of the camp is where there are replicas of tents to represent what the camp looked like on the inside. Key to note are the pigeon roosts or sentry towers overlooking the fence, watching the inside of the camp. So you can see everything about the camp focuses on the inside without being inside. Multiple accounts state that the guards suffered alongside their prisoners. That's true, but the guards caught less disease and died less of hunger than their prisoners did. As I said before, by the end of 1864, the number of prisoners had overwhelmed the camp management's capabilities. The camp was designed to hold one-fourth of the prisoners actually kept there. Food and resources were running low for the Confederate Army itself. Decisions were made by the camp management to conserve food rations and supplies for the defense of the Confederacy. What, the, what this decision meant was less food and less care for the prisoners inside, especially over the winter in between 1864 and 1865. Escape by conventional means such as tunneling or climbing the fence was out of the question due to the number of guards and just the average physical state of the prisoners. The most easiest form of escape from the prison was playing dead and making a run for it after being buried with the tens of other prisoners that died that day. Confederate records show that only 351 inmates total escaped from Andersonville. Also interesting fact, inside the prison itself, there was no lawmaking law or regulation, so some of the prisoners would form gangs and attack other prisoners and even kill them for their stuff. And so eventually other gangs were formed called regulators that would enforce the law and they winded up actually hanging six perpetrators and they're buried separately from the rest of the other prisoners who died at the camp. Over the course of Andersonville's existence, 45,000 prisoners were held there. Of those, 13,000 or 28% died. After the war, the commandant of the camp Captain Henry Wirtz was sentenced to death for the conditions of the camp. Captain Henry Wirtz was one of three men convicted for war crimes following the end of the American Civil War. After checking out the camp, I was met with the sobering sight of the cemetery. The oldest part of the cemetery holds the prisoners who died at Andersonville, narrowly spaced due to the sheer number of dead within the short period of time. There's monuments dedicated by all the Union states who had prisoners held at Andersonville, such as New York, Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, so on and so forth. After the war, the property These are all the other states that don't have monuments here, but I guess they could chip in for this one. And maintained by them until 1910 when it was donated to the yeah, federal government. Let's go all the way the down. cemetery was turned into a national cemetery, much like Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia. So the families of veterans of all the wars that the United States fought in afterwards can elect to inter their loved ones here. It contains 13,714 graves of which 921 are marked as unknown. 
without further ado, let's get into the actual travel vlog. If you like my content, if you like what I'm doing with my channel, go ahead and like and subscribe. Here's the rest of the video. I am at Andersonville POW camp, or whatever the title of this place is. Essentially, they had all the POWs during the Civil War, the Confederates, had all of their POWs here at this area. Huge area because of the number of prisoners that they had. Unfortunately for the Confederates, they did not nearly have the resources and motivation to take care of them. Here we just have the monuments that you kind of see at every single Civil War site where each state that had people that were here or participated in battles they'll put up their own stuff. So that one over there see if I can zoom up on it. That one over there is Michigan. And then this one over here is Ohio. this giant pillar each one basically says the same thing to her loyal sons who died here in this place is known as Andersonville but it was called Camp Sumter and we'll check out these ones right here as well this one's interesting because it's actually from Tennessee <laughs> and it looks like they annotated on the end after they made this like if you see it right here, they annotated 1284 and then it looks like they kind of hand wrote this. Okay, yeah, they wrote 1284 and they kind of hand wrote died down here. But just like a reminder, even though that you think of Tennessee as like a southern state, they, even though you think of Tennessee as like a southern state, they still had people that, that fought for the Union and were interned here not far from where their home state is. Georgia is just across the, the border. Not very far, maybe 200 miles, 100 miles. These are all the other states that don't have monuments here, but I guess they could chip in for this one. Yeah, and these monuments just go all the way down. We have Delaware, Kansas, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, New Hampshire, Vermont, West Virginia. Yeah, they need to go back to that calling the army that the grand army of the republic some star wars star wars stuff it's a beautiful day here it is like 75 degrees it's been raining and miserable the last couple of days it's march um march 7th today so it's like basically the first day of spring here in georgia beautiful day but you can imagine the winters here are actually not that warm as you would think there's a lot of frost it's very cold at night especially for people that just showed up with what they had on them and if that wasn't ransacked by the confederate soldiers that took them prisoner and used for their own purposes like you it's crazy it's crazy I'm just gonna walk around here and see what's up. Here we have an example of what the wall looked like. You can kind of see on the top there the towers poking out, the guard towers. And if you notice, they're all facing inwards. They're there to watch the prisoners over here, to watch them, not really, not really about keeping other people out. Here they have like a little mock-up of what the gate looked like. I'm sure that they had to rebuild this. So you can just, here, I'll come over here. Here's a mock-up of what the front gate looked like. So you can just imagine yourself in the shoes of a Union soldier. You've been taken prisoner and you're escorted into these walls. Super tall, 
doesn't look like there's much of a way out. You're cold and the sun's going down. Man. And then you come out here and you see thousands of fellow compadres all starving, not very much shelter, not very much water or food. It's a rough day for you, bro. This camp is known less for uh, the Confederates deliberately killing the Union soldiers, but rather their lack of care for prisoners of war, where they allocated them much less food, much less resources to take care of themselves in here. Like, most of the times, the Union soldiers would have to tear off pieces of wood from the wall to, like, build themselves shelters and stuff like that. So, yeah, the Confederates did not take proper care of their prisoners. While the Nazis deliberately did not take care of them because they wanted them to die. The Confederates, maybe if they had more resources and, you know, all that other jazz, maybe they could have done more. But they didn't. So... This is the, uh, the spring the prisoners used to give themselves water. Now, they actually didn't discover this spring. Ooh, echoey. They didn't discover this spring until 1864. There's a lot of growth in there. They actually didn't discover the spring until 1864. Um... So by that time, the Civil War was already almost over. And like, prisoners of war were getting exchanged and stuff like that. And the majority of deaths had already occurred by this point. But it did help to alleviate a lot of the debt that was coming to this place. This is a lovely spring. Obviously, this spring and these channels were all built after the Civil War was over when they were building this place into a nice little park. Here's a cool picture of what the camp looked like. You can kind of see on here just like all the small little tents shelters really that they built throughout the camp and then they had to add in 1864 another 10 acres to this place so by 1864 things were getting pretty dire here you can see here they have as you can see here they have a fort up here and another fort up here so that way, I guess they had a suitable defense here. Yeah, I'm getting hella Auschwitz vibes from that gate. <laughs> kind of like, beware all ye who enter here type of vibes. They do a good job of maintaining the park though. Very good job. Each of the corners, they have these sort of cannon emplacements. As you can see above these, like, sort of, like, hill-like embankments at each of the corners. But what I thought was interesting was right here. What it says right here. With these guns, a few guards were able to control thousands of prisoners. Canister could cut a wide swath through a crowd. Oh, good lord. So I guess... The cannons were used for crowd control? That's crazy. Kind of same thing over here. These guns could defend against a cavalry attack loaded and aimed at the prison yard. Confederate cannon also discouraged mass escape. So basically, the whole point of the cannons was less about defense. They weren't really worried about Union attack deep in the interior of Georgia. This place is out in the middle of nowhere. They were more worried about just all the prisoners escaping and turning into a gi giant massive rabble rampaging across the Georgia countryside. 
Ooh Basically what this one says is that the people we have to thank for this site being preserved is uh, the Women's Relief Corps who actually took care of this site and paid to like buy up the land around it and then they donated it all to the federal government. Pretty nice of them. It's this empty field back here just outside the walls of Camp Sumter was where the hospital was at. So if you were brought to the hospital, you weren't gonna get better. You were probably gonna die based just on the, on the sanitary conditions back then. This is probably how you wind it up. This quote right here is crazy. The hospital is a tough place to be in. In some cases before a man is fairly dead, he is stripped of everything, coat, pants, shirt, finger rings. These the nurses trade to the guards. Nuts. This cool little stair step over to here. I guess this is where the fort was. So the officers and the post commander lived over here in this enclosed area. I have a view of it from higher up, but you can see here how like they had built up the, the dirt around here to create a sort of wall. And there's probably even another wooden fence right here guarded by all these cannons overlooking overlooking the main <laughs> overlooking the main prison over in this direction you can see the monuments over there in that corner over there behind my car is where the hospital was at and even further back behind the actual camp is where the cemetery is at and that's where we'll go next sign when talking about the fort it really details what they were in they they were uh, in a besieged state of mind always thinking that because of how many prisoners they had these prisoners were bound to have a mass breakout and so it says out of like the the five cannon um or the nine cannons that they had at the fort four were pointed outwards the other five were pointed inwards towards the camp itself so it was all about containment through mass artillery fire <laughs> instead of you know instead of actually just making the camp a better place to live i mean i know they didn't have the resources but like yeah they definitely didn't try hard enough so you can kind of see out in the distance that right there is the spring we were at and the sort of uh, gate into the actual Camp Sumter. This whole low area here, because it kind of slopes up right here on this side and then slopes up over there on, on that side. This whole low area here is where they had the actual latrines. So the walls of the fort would just keep all the sewage right here in the middle and you can see why they had such problems with disease and dysentery in this place. Good gracious. You ever watch Masters of Air on Apple TV? Yeah, I don't think it goes well for them there. Beautiful day to walk a cemetery. The funny part about this part of the cemetery is like you have this in the center, and that's the US Army's crest right there. And then um, the National Park Service, because this place used to be owned by the War Department. And then it was given over to the National Park Service afterwards. Just interesting thoughts. So yeah, Andersonville. 
National Cemetery. On par with Arlington, honestly.